Welcome to the Joyful Nourishment Podcast. This is a podcast about a relationship with food and eating, body image, eating disorder recovery, mental health. So I wonder, um, Miguel, if we can sort of switch tack a bit and talk about your professional experience and the work that you've done particular in, but I suppose I'm guessing it also intersects with the a lot of the work that you've done in clinical nutrition and in neuroscience and looking at this gut brain axis and the microbiome and the gut brain or the gut in intersection between gut function or gut health and mental health because you've done a lot of work you know around that area so I suppose first of all is like what are we talking about if we you know I feel as well in the last number of years a bit of this is like thrown around like sort of mainstream but it's like do people really know what we're talking about when we're talking about the gut brain axis or the intersections between gut health and mental health like so how would you like how would you describe that or explain that to people if you're people have heard the terms but are not really sure what what you're talking about yeah so you have um uh, gut microbes, um, mostly we're talking about gut bacteria because when you talk about the interface with nutrition as well and, and food, it's mostly bacteria that will help you extract nutrients from those foods. So even though you have other microorganisms like um, viruses and parasites and fungi and so on in the gut, they may not be so important when it comes to that relationship with the with the brain. Um, just because the the gut bacteria communicate with the brain through a range of different mechanisms. So they produce um, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine that may actually not reach the brain. Um, like serotonin, for example, a lot of the serotonin that's produced in the gut is used just to regulate bowel motions and, and, and so on. It's, it's used to regulate, regulate the, the movement of the actual gut as opposed to keep you happy by getting into the brain and so on. There's there's, there's a lot of misconception around that. But there will be things like dopamine being produced in the gut, like GABA, um, which is uh, a relaxing inhibitory um, neurotransmitter. Uh, These microbes will also regulate your immune function by actually uh, regulating the interface between how nutrients reach the the gut and how those nutrients are then transformed into different molecules, chiefly short chain fatty acids. Um, so waxy molecules, um, mostly we talk about butyrate, uh, which is a molecule that is quite similar to the waxiness that you find in butter, the oiliness you find in butter. And uh, it has this um, very soothing, very anti-inflammatory effect, both locally and also on the brain. Um, and, uh, and, and all of these things are going on. There's a, a production. It, it's almost like food comes into your mouth. It's translated into, it's churned by the stomach and the small intestine is, is then, um, um, it gets to the colon It's translated into different nutrients and different molecules that, uh, carry messages to that can mean something to the brain. And these messages are carried through by the vagus nerve. Uh, that is this very um, substantial uh, piece of hardware that connects the the uh, various different organs, um, including the adrenal glands and the uh, and the gut and the brain, and particularly an area of the brain that well, a series of areas in the brain called the limbic system that harbors the amygdala, and the hippocampus, and all the areas in there that are um a bit like the emotional control center of the of the body so uh the vagus nerve also is is a really important piece of the parasympathetic nervous system which is the rest and repair kind of a branch of um, the autonomic nervous system uh, as part of the whole nervous system and there's a lot of talk now about nervous system regulation and calming your nervous system and you know resetting your nervous system is is become really trendy well, you need to have a nervous system that is responsive and and resilient more than calm, uh, and uh, and and microbes in your gut will allow you to do that. So they play a role in that kind of uh, 
uh, responsiveness and resilience of the of the connection between gut and brain. And then you have the whole piece of mental health. So what is mental health as such? So it's kind of a, a emotional, psychological, it's social well-being. It's how we think and how we feel and how we act and how we handle stress and uh, and how that relates to our physical well-being and the and the well-being of others as well. And if if we want to experience that as in as as an integral way as possible, without obviously um, the uh, um, the constraints of of severe mental illness, which is not normally when we, what we talk about when we talk about mental health. We talk about mental health as in, in general, kind of like positive mental health or mild mental illness. So we might talk about anxiety, but we might talk about low mood without going into the extremes of clinical depression or schizophrenia or bipolar, which yeah. are also mental health conditions. But we tend to focus more on on mental well being when we talk about mental health, and yeah. and that definitely has a, um, a an interface with 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 the gut uh, microbiome. So the way it happens is that you have a, if you have a gut microbiome that is a hundred percent of your microbes could be cataloged into different groups, then that composition of that library of microbes that you have in your gut can be an indication of the kind of um, susceptibility you might have to develop different conditions, including mental health conditions. So the flip side of that is that if you can change that library to go from loads of potentially negative microbes to few of those potentially negative microbes and more of the potentially beneficial microbes, then you have better chances of experiencing better mental well-being. So in a nutshell is that there's a lot of uh, the relationships that we find in science are to do with composition as well as the function. So, but the composition and the function go hand in hand because if you have, uh, if one of the chunks of, of, of these uh, microbes that you have in your gut are butyrate producers, and we know that butyrate or butyric acid is beneficial for mental health, by association, even if you don't know how much butyric acid is available in the gut at any given time, because you haven't measured it uh, specifically with a, a particular test. But if you know that you have 25% of your microbes are butyric producers, that is going to be better than if you have only 10. So a lot of the studies kind of look at that composition as the as an indicator of your susceptibility to experience better mental health. And not only mental health, I mean, the, because the, the microbiome is, is become so trendy now, both at mainstream level, but also research level, there are all of these connections or access. So there's the gut brain access, but also the skin, the gut skin access, the cancer access, the gut liver access. So literally, there are connections between the microbiome and any condition that you can think of and any organ or body system that you can think of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what I've been, you know, the, the, uh, the microbiome kind of like journey for me started before my master's and uh, a kind of like clin clinical level going back to the noughties, just seeing cultures of, um, of um, stool samples and seeing what happened uh in um in different settings both in clinic and also at retreat centers when i was kind of uh, going back to being a student and that was my first exposure to seeing microbiome samples uh, basically a, a pool sample in a micro under a microscope i'm thinking oh wow i can see things moving there and i can i can see that is somebody who was a microbiologist was telling me that is candida so I was, okay that i see what candida looks like in a in a plate um, so that's kind of like my first experience of things that are quite ad hoc up to then doing lots of testing during my early practice years. Um, I was really keen on testing the gut during those years. Um, and, uh, and then through my interest in that, um, and I was kind of a leading 
Uh, I had a volunteer role in an association as well. So I was kind of like well known in certain circles and so on. And uh, I um, I connected with uh, Professor Tim Spector and I did some work with him on uh, the, what is the prequel to, what was the prequel to the SOA app. Um, so I spent two years working with him at um, um, uh, King's College. And I had, I, I was just doing my master's at the same time. No, oh, just finishing my master's. I was in the middle of it anyway, I think, yeah. And uh, and I, that was my master's in clinical neuroscience. And there were bits that were mentioned between the, that connection between the gut and the brain, but it wasn't like a full master's on the gut-brain connection. It was clinical neuroscience as a whole. And I did my thesis on mitochondria, actually, like neural stem cells, uh, mitochondria in stem cells uh, and how they were affected by nutrients. So I did um, experiments with vitamin C and serin and coenzyme Q10 and NAD plus, uh, this kind of like vitamin B3 derivative. And uh, obviously they meant nothing because they were just in a test tube and they were cute things to do and it made me feel quite grown up, but <laughs> it didn't have any translation to to humans uh, doing that. And that's what kind of like made me, what journey do I want to take me doing a lot more of this work in a lab that I actually found really interesting. It was quite grounding, just being there with all your test tubes and and all your pipettes and blah blah and your growth factors and all whatever it made you feel quite responsible for your for your cells as well because you have to go back and feed them every day and make sure that they were not contaminated and all of this so it was, all, it was almost like having a puppy you had to make <laughs> sure that it was always well fed and happy and uh and i had an opportunity that didn't happen and I'm glad that it didn't happen because it would have been just me working on a particular molecule to do with Alzheimer's and and that probably would have been a you know an interesting enough PhD to do but quite narrow uh, and in the end I thought okay well I'm just going to move on to something else and actually do a try and, and put things in a more of a translatable context so I can move uh, I can translate some of what I've learned into the general public. So there was an, an opportunity to do that. And initially I was going to focus on aging and I was going to use a lot of um, patient reported outcomes. So asking people how they felt um, and and using that as, as, as a valid kind of source of information and not just focus on the biological data that comes in clinical trials. And that was the overarching theme anyway of what I did. But I focused, I ended up like switching focus after a year or so to the gut brain. Um, so I, I did, in the end, I did a couple of um, clinical trials and I did uh, um, a, a, all that few bits of uh, unpublished uh, research um, as part of my doctoral degree in um, gut microbiome and mental health. Yeah, so like... Do you think, and I know like from my understanding, it's like that we know a lot more now than we did 10 years ago, but we're still, we still don't know a huge amount. Like there's still a lot more to discover, right, in this area. But from your work and like what you've seen, like are there a translation into, like are, are there ways that we can affect our microbiome that will translate into potential better mental health, particularly if you're maybe in that uh, lower, like like less good mental health without being in the extremes, obviously. Yeah, and I think those are, for me, that's been an interesting step as well, as, as well as in my, my own kind of like personal growth journey and looking at things from a, a more kind of like a, like a softer, I want to say even like a, a like more feminine approach because I think like science can be very masculine. It can be very, you know, so you have the, it's very young, it's very, uh, you know, it can be a bit forceful and a bit like numbers and and this kind of, uh, you know, the the um, the best science is, and the, the most robust, robust science is science that is numerical and quantitative. And then you have the qualitative and that tends to be like, or oh, softer and a bit more feminine and and it's almost like it's not so credible because it's like you know it's got that element of that and I'm thinking 
I explored that a lot during my my doctoral degree as well because I started just wanting to be all about numbers and and even though I wanted to bring in that element of softness of the translation and asking involving the participant in the study so they were not just a number um I was still looking at it from that very kind of uh um positivist angle I was looking at it from that angle of um it needs to be so robust nobody should question it with us you know five years on I was actually quite happy to be questioned I was actually thinking this I'm never going to know everything there is to know I don't need to understand everything that that is to be understood and I'm quite happy for things to be a little bit woolly sometimes uh and then when you look at science and you think okay how do you precisely manipulate the microbiome of somebody when this is a, a living entity that is like a forest? If you go to the forest now, you step out of your house, you have a forest in front of your house and you have deer and you have slugs and I don't know, bats and rabbits and fish and whatever. And you go there three months later and it's changed with the season and the rabbits may have died because it's coming to the end of the summer and they, a lot of them die and because they get these conditions and they die at the end of the summer and that's normal. So then the rabbits are not eating so much of some plants and some plants are thriving. There's all these changes happening all the time. The microbiome is the same. Your gut is the forest and there are various different foods coming in, various foods that are innate to the to that particular ecosystem, like the mucus in your gut is eaten by certain microbes. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. Sometimes those microbes are higher, sometimes they are lower. How do you know from day to day what the microbiome needs exactly? So you can do this really specific prescription that, you know, people say mm. oh, is precision medicine is, uh, you know. And also, as you say, how can we do something that's going to have some benefits to our mental well-being we're not talking about how can you create a protocol to reverse uh, or to eradicate um, stage four cervical cancer through the microbiome and you think okay well that we're talking like big words here we're talking like it's the severity of the condition is such that if you're going to do a study it needs to be very precise you need to manipulate certain bacteria. Maybe you do it with, like, I don't know, some specific supplements or a drug or whatever. Things that people can do everywhere with um, that are cheap and accessible and that are not like just, again, not just for an elite that needs them. And I think, well, whole grains, like whole grains, again, I was kind of like gaslighting myself for years thinking whole grains, I know they come up in every study I read about the microbiome. Uh, there's a big thing about the Mediterranean diet and the microbiome because it's a very diverse kind of a pattern of eating fresh and, you know, different foods and whatever. And whole grains, if you look at the actual reviews that are pools of data and they look at what are the key aspects of Mediterranean diets around the Mediterranean, uh, olive oil, uh, and whole grains probably right at the top. And then, of course, you know, diversity of different colors and everything else. But like people don't just eat like pomegranate in Spain, just, even though it sounds like very Mediterranean. Or they don't just eat tomatoes and like cucumber and, you know, kale or whatever. The, the bulk of the what they eat is quite whole grainy. I mean, I see my mom and dad. My dad is 92. My mom is 88. They eat bread every day. They don't even eat like, you know, like super wholesome, like sourdough, homemade bread. It's like white bread from, you know, from the shop. But they eat that and they have rice. And again, it's not like brown rice. It's not like super pure, you know, organic. Blah, blah. It's just this regular Spanish white rice. It's still got fiber. Um, you know, all of those things are important. So I'm thinking whole grains are really important. Um, why? Because if you have more whole grains, then you're more likely to have a better butyrate production. And then butyrate, if you look at studies as well, they uh, are telling you if you have things like low mood or if you're anxious. So if you're working that just on that on those two conditions, which a lot of people experience, 
then you're much better, you're much more likely to not feel them as intensely if you have better butyrate levels in your bloodstream and in your and going into your brain. So there's going to be less inflammation in your brain because butyrate is anti-inflammatory, and there's going to be less um, activation of the immune system in your brain because butyrate dampens that down. So it allows your brain to feel safe as opposed to on on a fight or flight response, which is what happens both in depression and in anxiety. So yeah. whole brains are massive in that kind of respect. Uh, and I think that's that's just one thing that people should be taking more, more seriously, you know, um, like I've been trying to have like the whole, actual the whole grain in my diet lately. So I've been buying um, wheat berries. I've been buying bulgur wheat. Um, so um, that is that the, this uh, Turkish bit that is literally just like the bits of, of wheat grain just like smashed into pieces. So it's almost as good as getting the whole wheat berry. And it, it ends up looking a little bit like couscous when you cook it. Um, barley, um, spelt, um, spelt flakes. They are delicious actually with like milk or with yogurt as a, a cereal. Um, not entirely a grain, it's more like a seed, but buckwheat and quinoa and things like that. Um, they they are all really important and I think they can actually be, a, they can bring a really interesting angle to to managing that that mental well-being that is accessible to everybody. Yeah, yeah, and that isn't, I mean, it is in most, most, at least this part of the world, there are kind of carbohydrates, like we do, we do eat them. Um, I mean, this, this part of the world we we probably don't eat I and mean, we don't grow rice in, in in Ireland or in the UK but you know wheat is uh like barley is is a big one and oats and you know those are those are natural exactly. staples and they're easy accessible and they tend to be quite cheap as well and I think it's like yeah like that of, of thinking about the accessibility and I'm, that always makes me wonder it's like oh you know I can feel sometimes like you know you eat a bowl of like rice with like one of my favorite things is like rice mixed with like stir fried vegetables and olive oil and maybe some other bits to it to flavor it. And just like, oh, it just feels so good. It's just like, ah, it's so calming. Or you can eat a bowl of porridge and it's like, ah, oh, it just feels good. <laughs> so maybe that's my butyrate producing um, gut bacteria that just goes, hey, we're super happy. And we're just sending this thing to your, to, to the brain. But I'm also curious, like, does it work the other way around? Like, if you're stressed and anxious or say you experience, like, you know, life challenges that are stressful or if your relationship with food is quite stressful, can that have an, an impact on the gut microbiome? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're in, a, in any situation of a fight or flight, then that any level of stress is going to have an impact on on the composition and the function of the gut microbiome because when you have stress the um the biochemistry of the body changes so there are the stress hormones are actually pumping through your system they need to be cleared from the system and that engages not only your liver but also the actual gut microbes that 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 help you metabolize that cortisol and other other stress hormones and and bring them out of your system in the in the feces because they are fat based so they go out in in the stool um so if they are doing that they are not going to be doing something else so you're kind of like diverting them from from what they need to be doing um to give you uh, the the best for your back in a way, which is allowing you to translate that food that you're eating into more ava available nutrients and uh, and short chain fatty acids. So that is a very simple kind of like explanation. But also, um, when you are chronically stressed because you're thinking about food all the time, that and that's bringing that level of anxiety about what you're eating, what you're not eating, and so on, then. Um, that stress 
is also going to have an impact on the integrity of the gut lining on the barrier between the the gut and the bloodstream and uh, and if that becomes weakened uh, what happens is that various different particles of food that should actually be contained in the gut and then come out in the stool or go into the bloodstream when they need to go into the bloodstream but not like all throughout the colon because the colon is it goes in stages and at different stages you need to be absorbing different nutrients then what happens if there is more more uh, porosity or permeability or people call it leaky gut as well which is a normal response of the body but it can be chronic as well then you're going to end up with with certain uh, bits of food that haven't been metabolized properly and they're going to end up in the in the bloodstream and the immune system will freak out thinking what is going on here and that can translate into a number of different situations from feeling unwell to feeling sensitive to foods so then you that can perpetuate your feeling that that food doesn't agree with you even though it's not a full-blown allergy so you're not going to get an anaphylactic shock from eating rice but if rice is something that when you eat makes you feel a bit sleepy or it makes you feel a bit uneasy or you know I'm just giving rice as an example it could be anything else like most people will be fine with rice but uh, things like dairy and gluten for example we already have this ingrained feeling that they are not good for us so lactose is going to be bad for me gluten will make me feel queasy or it will make me go to the toilet more or it's going to be bad for me anyway because lots of people tell me that and on top of that there's just slight change in how you feel after that meal and that is kind of like physiological that reinforces that feeling and that's mm -hmm. what I think it can be it can be dangerous it may not be the it may not be the gluten that is doing that in itself it's how resilient your nervous system is at that particular point and how resilient is that that membrane that separates the gut and the bloodstream uh, at uh, at that particular time as well? So okay. when you're calm, if you have the same, um, and and many people say this. So I go to France on holiday and I have baguettes every morning and uh, croissants, and I don't get bloated and I don't get the same symptoms that I get when I eat gluten back at home. And you think, okay, why is that? Because you're on holiday and you're chilled. You're not rushing about. You're maybe not so worried about how you're going to feel or you're disconnecting a little yeah. bit more. And, or I go to Italy and eat pasta, but if I eat pasta, the pasta must be different in Ireland because when I eat it, I feel bloated. It's exactly the same pasta in Ireland. Mm. I mean, it comes from Italy, most pasta anyway. So it's yeah. going to be exactly the same pasta that you're cooking at home in, in Ireland. And uh, as the pasta you ate in Rome, but it is triggering you in Ireland. Why? Because you're you're already thinking it's going to trigger you because oh, I mustn't eat pasta. Yeah, yeah, it's that kind of mind body connection, right? Just like how that interface with the psychology, with the physiology, and that's I think yeah. that's so fascinating with that gut brain axis or intersection that it is really that interface between physiology and psychology. So um, as we kind of bring this conversation to a close, um, and we talked about it, so many different things, but I always ask all my guests uh, about what joyful nourishment is to them. So I'm really curious for you in your multifaceted human being, um, as a human, multifaceted human being, what, what is joyful nourishment to you again? I think joyful nourishment for me is nourishment that um, that just feels right and that, that I, I am genuinely um, enjoying at that particular time without being stressed about how it's going to make me feel or am I going to put on weight or is it going to make me feel thinner if I eat less or if I eat more. I'm just being present at that particular time and enjoying the the flavors and the smells and the company the you talked about the the heritage as well so if i'm visiting my family in spain and it's something that we traditionally in spain to enjoy that and to honor that because there is value in that tradition as well and being passed from 
my mom and dad to me and she's cooked that with love and she's sharing the love in the in the cooking and all of that is it's just love in a way it's, um food is is a form of love and uh um like we know love can be tricky sometimes between people uh, and uh so food is no different sometimes it can be tricky between food and ourselves but if we allow ourselves to be loved and receive that full capacity that food has to love us and to nourish us i think that is that is um joyful um nourishment for me thanks so much and i'd loads more questions but i think <laughs> the conversation can't go on forever um but i know you're writing a book um like we said in the intro about the intersection between gut brain health nutrition and adhd or neurodivergence um so tell me a little bit check shortly about that and where people can find you as well if they want to go and check you out and check out your work yeah. further Sure. So the book is called Thrive with ADHD, and it will have elements of nutrition that will be very much based on mindful eating uh, because of my 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 own personal experience that that has been what's what's worked for me. But also there's a lot of science on mindful eating anyway and uh, and the ability to be self-compassionate. And uh, if you're self-compassionate, you are much more likely to not have some of the conditions that go hand in hand with ADHD, like depression and anxiety, for example. There are studies done on that. So, uh, so I tap on that mindful eating. I I talk about the neurobiology of the brain as well, and uh, obviously the gut brain connection as well. Um, it is going to be out either late 2024 or early 2025, and uh, and if you want to find me. Probably the best place is my Instagram. So um, Dr. Miguel Mateas, uh, I'll, um, I'm, I'm, I'm more active there than anywhere else. So if you enjoyed what you um, listened to today, then that's probably the best place to find me. Brilliant. I'll put all of those links in the show notes. And I know you have a sub stack as well. So, you know, and yeah. you have a great archive and, and great information there too. So I'll put it all in. But thank you so Wonderful. much for being part of this podcast and for this conversation today thank you Lane, for having me take care thanks for listening the joyful nourishment podcast is produced with no financial backing and your support means a lot to keep this project going if this episode has been helpful in any way please consider liking subscribing or leaving a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on this helps the podcast to be found by others And of course, you can also forward this episode to a friend whom you think may benefit. Find out more about what I offer on straightforwardnutrition.com. And if you're interested in working with me, please use the link in the show notes to book in for a free initial 30 minute session. And finally, please come and join the Joyful Nourishment community over on Substack unless you're there already by subscribing to my newsletter using the link below.